Thanks to Matt, who's leading the band this morning. We really appreciate it. Yeah, big whoops for Matt and the band. Appreciate it. Um, if you don't know Matt, he's great. This is also one of our uh, youth staff, Erin Yipia. She leads our youth choir, who's also leading today. Um, and so if you have teenagers and they like to sing, man, is she the person for you. She's the best. Um, I have not heard a word yet on the cameras, but Mark has prepared some dad jokes, if you guys are interested in that. One time only performance for just a small crowd. Dad jokes, dad jokes from Mark, yeah. I think there's a... I wasn't ready for this, okay, wow. All right, let me see, here we go. Things dads have to do is tell bad jokes and turn out all the lights and change the thermostat. All right, so these are Halloween themed jokes, all right. Why did the vampires cancel the baseball game? They couldn't find their bats. Yeah. I like the interactive why there, that was a good part. Let's make that a part of it. Why didn't the skeleton cross the road? It didn't have the guts. Uh, uh, I don't need, all right. What do you get if you cross a snowman and a vampire? Frostbite. Wait. Um, one, uh, two more. Why? Um, I'll, I'll skip the bad ones. Um, why do witches use brooms to fly? Because vacuum cleaners are too heavy. And one more. Um, what do you call a witch at the beach? Sandwich. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Mark. So appreciate your flexibility. This is a lot of how, if you guys don't know me, my name is Kat Bear. I'm the director of youth ministries here. So this kind of shenanigans is actually pretty much in my wheelhouse. We do a lot of this over um, in youth ministries, working with our middle and high school students. I'm still not hearing anything. So we're going to go, we're going to do another quick intermission and I'm going to check in with the TV crew upstairs and then hopefully we're going to get started. So thank you guys so much. You're all wonderful. Okay, so here's what's gonna happen. Thank you guys so much for just hanging with us for the last 15, 20 minutes. Um, we are still having a big internet issue, but we're just gonna record the service and people are, they're gonna rebroadcast it later this afternoon. So I'm really excited actually to just be, have this opportunity to worship with you guys right now, to have this kind of more intimate crowd. It's really special. Um, sorry about the mic. So first, a word of welcome. This is the first time the gathering has ever met indoors in the sanctuary as a whole group. So welcome. So excited that you're all here. Um, yeah, clap. Look at all of you. You registered. You showed up early. You wore your mask. You sat in your assigned seats. Ma'am, look up. God is good. Um, so that's really exciting. Uh, Lance Marshall, who normally leads this service, is on renewal leave right now. Um, so he will be out until around Thanksgiving. Um, so we have a whole slew of great guest preachers who are going to be here, including today is going to be Reverend Dr. Mike Marshall, who you guys all know, Mr. Mike, the participant. Um, is going to be here and he's going to be preaching. Um, we've also got Matt leading the band today, as I mentioned, so it should be a really fun service. Oh my gosh, look at those snaps. Um, 
People who are here, you do not need to mark your attendance because we know you are here. If you are watching online later, we'd still love to mark you as having attended or hear about what's going on in your life so you can fill out the attendance uh, button that's on the website or um, comment on the YouTube or comment on Facebook and we'd love to hear um, who's all worshiping with you and what you guys are up to. Giving, um, we encourage those who are here to go to our website maybe later at fumcfw.org um, and you will see a big give button. It is y'all's financial support that allows us to be here, that allows the space to be lit and air conditioned. Um, and we are so grateful for your continued generosity throughout this entire season. Um, we're gonna ask during the service that you please keep your masks on for the entirety of the service and to worship in a way other than singing during the music. Uh, Matt introduced this earlier, but you are welcome to pray, to journal, to clap along, to um, drum on the back of your seat. I saw some dancing by the Bimbanex, so anything like that is great. We encourage you to engage in worship in a new way that's not singing during this service. Um, at the end of the service, you'll be dismissed by ushers, and they will let you know when you can step out. We have some amazing ushers who will be here, and will be very clearly indicating when and where you are supposed to leave. Finally, um, we want to talk about our discipleship program. It's called Worship Plus One. So you're already doing the first one, worship, which is showing up and being part of a worship service, either virtually or in person at some point throughout the course of the week. And we encourage you to engage your discipleship by adding one additional piece to your faith journey. Maybe that's a grace group, maybe that's a um, service project, maybe that's giving, maybe that's serving on a committee, but particular this week we'd like to highlight GROW. GROW is our big church Bible study that's being led by a huge group of our pastors that starts as an all group together teaching time and then breaks into small groups for discussion. That's on Wednesday nights at 6 p.m. You can just show up um, if you're showing up virtually. If you want to come in person, you can register online. No previous reading required, no homework required. Um, whether it's your first Bible study or your hundredth Bible study, it should be a really informative, fun way to connect and grow. So we're really excited about that. So you can check out Grow on our website as well. Now we are going to embark in our worship service with a call to worship. So those of you who are at home, you might see the words on your screen. Those of you who are with us, the response is going to be, God of heaven, come down. So say it after me. God of heaven, come down. Great. That's based on a song that you're about to hear um, as a way for you to think about those words and to really pray them when you hear them in the song. So um, I'll kind of gesture when you guys are supposed to respond. We gather together, separated by screens and at least six feet, and we hold on to the hope that you, Holy Spirit, will join us here. We pray and worship and serve together, joining in your work to make our world more loving, more just, more like the kingdom you call it to be. We cry out to you in our hopes, in our fears, in our highest and lowest moments, and ask that you come and walk alongside us in them. God of heaven, come down. Amen. Well, hello again, everybody, and welcome to the gathering. Like Kat said, my name is Matt. I'm on youth staff here. Um, and because I feel a little bit bad that Aaron and I got special shout outs, I'm also going to introduce you to the rest of the band because they're great. Uh, this is Rick. He's playing electric. Tim on the keys, you see him often. And then Easton Green over here on bass. Um, they're all great. They've all volunteered time over the last six months, and we really appreciate all that they've done. Um, also, big shout out to all of our ushers that are here this morning, helping and getting people seated. Um, it's been a huge undertaking on the task of volunteers and staff here just to make this possible, and so we're really grateful for that. The song that we're going to start with this morning is called Song of Hope. It's one that we've done before here, um, and we, like Kat said, we encourage you to spend this time um, in prayer or doodling or dancing or drumming on the back of your seats, whatever you can do to engage with worship that doesn't involve singing.
Awesome. Thank you, Matt and the band. Um, we are now going to enter into our time of prayer together. Every time we gather together, we pray together. We speak to God knowing that God listens, and we listen to God knowing that God speaks. We pray together in this service through something we call prayers to the people. You'll hear a couple times throughout the prayer, Lord, in your mercy, and we encourage you, whether, rather in here, <laughs> rather you're in here or at home, to respond with, hear our prayer. So let's try that. Lord, in your mercy. Wonderful. At the end of the prayer, I'll lift up some names and then ask, are there any others? We encourage you to lift up the names of people that are on your hearts for prayer, either for celebrations or because they could use an extra surrounding of God's love today. So with that being said, let's bow our heads and pray together. Merciful and gracious God, we gather here this day together seeking your healing wisdom. Our lives are filled with anxiety and fear. We turn our backs on people in need and close ourselves away from opportunities to serve. Confusion and anger abound in our nation and in our hearts. Forgive us when we have chosen pathways of greed and fear instead of the higher way of peace and hope. Bring up our sounds and calm our spirits. Teach us again to turn to you in love. Take the commandment to love our neighbor as ourselves and write it on our palms, bond it, bind it on our doorways, and seal it in our hearts. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Lord, in your mercy. Father God, you are the creator of all things, everything, and everything that you create, you proclaim to be good. Evidence of the goodness of your creation continues to testify all around us, new lives, new hopes, new joys, new opportunities. For all of these blessings, we give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy. At the same time, O oh God, everything you create, you make to be free. Over and over again, that freedom is used for purposes of sin, for separation from you, for violence, for oppression, for greed. Remind us that when we were at our worst, you did not give up from us or turn, give up on us or turn away from us. Instead, you joined us, came alongside us in the power and presence of your Son, Jesus Christ, not to condemn us, but to redeem us and draw us back to you. For the salvation offered to us in Jesus, O oh God. We give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy. Always and everywhere, O oh God, we are not alone. Through the Holy Spirit, you guide us, inspire us, and shine a light before our feet so that we might learn to walk in your ways. For your presence, your love, your guidance, O oh God, we give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy. For Regina, Lord, in your mercy. For Alana, Lord, in your mercy. For Jackson, Lord, in your mercy. Are there any others? Lord, in your mercy. For all the names spoken out loud and all the names kept in the silence of our hearts, hear our prayers. For all who seek the strength to face another day of difficulty and pain, hear our prayers. For all who seek to change their hearts and lives and find peace in you, hear our prayers. And for each and every one of us, seeking to experience your love and know your will, hear our prayers. Guide us, keep us, make us into your people. And Lord, in your mercy. Amen. I'm now going to invite up Mr. Mark to come uh, talk to our young people here. Well, good morning, friends, here in the sanctuary and to friends at home. We are all together in the ways that matter the most. We're together in Holy Spirit, and we're together uh, today through a great story of our faith. I've got the Bible, and so we're going to do the Bible song. Now, our friends here in the sanctuary aren't able to sing, but what you can do is provide the beat. And then all of our friends at home, you're going to sing the song with me. So we're going to do the, this is the Bible, the book of God's love. We'll get a steady beat going. Then we get to the part where I hold it up and our friends at home are going to go, oh, and I want you to go, oh, so loud that those of us here in the sanctuary can hear you. We'll all wave our hands like this in here for the ah, and then we'll clap again for the rest. Let's get a steady beat. That's a good beat. All right, friends at home, here we go. This is the Bible, the book of God's love. This is the Bible, the book of God's love, written by people inspired from above. Oh, 
This is the Bible, the book of God's love. Excellent job, all of you. And today's story, you're gonna hear a slightly different version of this in a little bit, is a story that has a lot of feelings in it. Feelings are incredibly important. God gave us all of our feelings and we get to feel all those feelings. Now listen carefully to this story. Every time I mention a different feeling, I want you to make your face like that feeling. Like if I say happy, make a happy face. And friends at home, it's very interesting to see the happy faces of people wearing masks right now. But you know, it's interesting. We're all getting pretty good at reading eyes, aren't we? Yeah, I don't ever want to play go fish with you because you're going to know what my cards are. All right, so watch very carefully. Listen, make the face, and then hold that face until you hear the next feeling, the next emotion. Here we go. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was excited and asked, who is this? The crowds answered joyfully, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple courts and was angry. And friends at home, I wanna make sure you're making an angry face right now. At what he saw, he drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. All there were very surprised, including the doves. It is written, he said to them sternly, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you have, are making it a den of robbers. Those who could not see and those who struggled to walk were filled with hope as they came to Jesus at the temple and with kindness, he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children joyfully shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were very irritated. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, he replied calmly. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants? You, Lord, have called forth your praise. All there were filled with wonder as Jesus left them and went out to the city of Bethany to spend the night. You know, there's all kinds of feelings in that story, including anger. And sometimes in church we can think, oh, we're not supposed to feel angry. We're just supposed to be in right, outright, upright, downright, happy all the time. But that's not true. You know, this place we're in right now is called the sanctuary, which means safe place. Where you are right now needs to be a sanctuary, a safe place. And part of that safety means the safety to feel whatever it is you need to feel right now. God put those feelings in you for a reason, all of them. And sometimes the appropriate feeling is anger, like when people are being treated unfairly. The important thing is to read the Bible, read the stories of Jesus, and to discover not only is it okay to have the feelings, but when. When is it that Jesus is joyful? When is it that Jesus feels grateful and shows that gratitude? When is Jesus sad and crying? And when is it that Jesus is getting angry? That doesn't mean we can just get angry over every little thing all the time, but to really think, when is it appropriate to have this feeling? When is it appropriate to have that feeling, including anger. And I want our closing today to be a passage of scripture from the Old Testament. And this comes from Proverbs 16.32. And it goes like this. The one who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. Now, notice it doesn't say the one who never gets angry. It's okay to get angry sometimes. But sometimes we need to slow down and think about why am I getting so angry about this? And sometimes there's not a good reason, and sometimes there's a very good reason. So here's what we're going to do. The one who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. We're going to warm up our lap drums, and we're going to go, the one who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. We'll do it loud, and we'll do it at about that tempo. So let's try that, and let's say it together into our masks or at home, just into your waffles. All right, here we go. The one who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. Taking a breath. <sighs> Let's do that a little slower. 
the one who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. Let's take in a breath. <sighs> one more time, even slower. The one who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. <sighs> Loving God, thank you for all of our feelings and thank you for Jesus who shows us and models for us when to feel what. Amen. Mr. Mark, Mr. Mark, Mr. Mark, thank you for reminding us that God do does give us all of our feelings. And I love the fact that in the gathering, one of the feelings that's always present is gratitude. And it's no accident, because I think all of us have watched Reverend Lance Marshall create a culture of gratitude here. And it shows up in every worship service. Just think how many times this morning already someone has said thank you to you. Someone like Kat or Matt or others who have greeted you at the door. This culture of gratitude I am so grateful for and for Lance's leadership. Uh, for all of us who are part of the staff team, I can't tell you how many times that uh, he comes to us and says basically two things. Thank you for what you do, and what can I do to help you? And that means everything, I think. Well, speaking of a team, that's what I like the most about being part of this team, being an associate pastor here. My name is Mike Marshall. Uh, Dr. Brewster likes to call me the Elder Marshall. I did the math, and I've been serving in this church for 20 out of 23 years. I mean, that just shocks me. I had a three-year period in between when I was sent to be a, a missionary to Johnson County, and then I had a chance to come back. And I can't begin to tell you how grateful that I am to be here and serve with you. And uh, I am married. My wife's name is Jan. We have three children and two grandchildren, and probably a third grandchild on the way this week. And we are very excited about that. <laughs> We're in a series called Jesus the Good Troublemaker. And today, Jesus is uh, creating some chaos with, uh, with economic injustice, the ways that we keep people from community by forcing them to offer money that really they don't have. Um, I know that you've noticed the altar, and it's just so beautiful and so evocative, and it's been created by people like Elaine Johnson and, and Lisa Helm and, and Reverend Phyllis Barron and Barbara Duckworth and so many others, and I think the idea is it's not only be beautiful, but there are prickly things here. There are irritants here, and Jesus sometimes can prickle us, can remind us that there are better ways for us to live. And that's what this morning is about. So my message this morning, really you can think about it in three parts. The first part is a story that goes back a long, long time. The second part is looking at the scripture again. Mr. Mark gave us a great way to look at the scripture using our whole bodies. And, uh, and then the third part is a more recent story, a story that took place this past weekend. So, long, long ago, 45 years ago, during the basketball season of 1975, in a tiny town in northwestern Illinois, I had the chance to be part of a team, which throughout my life is something that I've always enjoyed. And in northwestern Illinois, where basketball is like football here, uh, weekends were magical. Friday night and Saturday night, there were always games. And then on Saturday nights, after we finished playing, 
we would go to somebody's house and we would all jam into the TV room so that we could watch the UCLA Bruins play from Pauley Pavilion in LA, coached by the great John Wooden, the wizard of Westwood. I mean, it was fun for us because our team used one of his inventions, the, the one, two, one, one full court press. It even worked for us. It really worked for them. It was just, it was stunning. And the results for UCLA were always stunning. John Wooden retired in 1975. That year they won their, their 10th national championship. For goodness sakes, they won seven in a row, seven years in a row. They were the best college basketball team in the country. They were a masterpiece. They were a masterpiece of basketball, and that's what we thought we were watching on Saturday nights. But really, what we were watching were life lessons. Life lessons for being a masterpiece every day. And the truth of the matter is, this wise, kind, good man who, whenever he spoke, people really did listen to him, his life was that way because of his father, who ironically, when he graduated in, uh, from school in this little town in Indiana, his father gave him a three, point, three by five note card. And on the note card, it had these seven principles that his father thought would help him in life. And he incorporated those into everything he did as a coach, as a mentor, as a husband. His wife's name is on the basketball court. That's how important she was to him and to that school. And the most important thing that was part of that three by five card was this phrase, make each day your masterpiece. Make each day your masterpiece. And so he did. And then he began to create his own phrases. And my favorite phrase that he shared with his players and has shared with so many people is the phrase, be quick, but don't hurry. Be quick, but don't hurry. Be quick, be quick to do what is right, but don't hurry. Don't miss out on what's going on around us. He talked about that, that activity without achievement didn't really get people any place at all. When I read this passage from Matthew's Gospel, that phrase jumped in my head, be quick, but don't hurry. And I think that's part of the reason why Jesus, as soon as he enters Jerusalem, according to Matthew, he goes right to the temple and all kinds of chaos ensues. Let me read to you, and if you brought a Bible or uh, if you have your device, uh, as Mark shared earlier, Mark did his paraphrase on Matthew chapter 21, verses 10 through 16. This is the Common English Bible. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up. Who is this, they asked. The crowd answered, meaning the people that had been following Jesus. It's the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Then Jesus went into the temple and threw out all those who were selling and buying there. He pushed over the tables used for currency exchange and the chairs of those who sold doves. He said to them, it's written, my house will be called a house of prayer but you've made it a hideout for crooks. People who were blind and lame came to Jesus in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and legal experts saw the amazing things he was doing and the children shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were angry. They said to Jesus, 
Do you hear what these children are saying? Yes, Jesus answered. Haven't you ever read from the mouths of babies and infants you've arranged praise for yourself? That last phrase comes from uh, Psalm 8. And that psalm is so beautiful and so appropriate, it could be used by us every morning as a way of praising God and reminding us to, to be quick, but don't hurry, to be alert to what is going on around us. And so this story, you know, where there's stuff lying all over the place, if you saw Dr. Brewster's blog this week, he does such a good job with the background of the story. And so I encourage you to read it if, if you haven't. Because in it, the essence of it is that, that those who were least able to pay what it took for the annual temple tax or to pay to have a dove or some other animal to use for an offering, those were the, were the people who were preyed upon. They were preyed upon in ways that were really despicable. And these were the people that were most sincere in their desire to want to come and to worship. It's, I've always thought of the story being done in a small space where Jesus threw over a couple tables, but, but really when you read some of the commentators, you realize that the court of the Gentiles was just part of many courts and that this whole temple complex was pro it, it was more like us going to the Fort Worth Stock Show or the State Fair of Texas. And there's just, there are animals and people and buildings and you can't hear anything. And I think Jesus recognized that he needed to, to bring that to an end, the economic side and also the side where people couldn't pray, they couldn't worship. He wanted people to have access to community, to sacred community. And so he did what he did, and really it was appreciated most by what disciple Bible study always called the least and the last and the lost, those who were in need, children. Children have always had the ability to see all of us for who we are. And in this story, they certainly do that as well. Jesus, in a way, I think, was saying to us today that we don't need a temple where we have to go and pay for certain things to have a mechanical kind of faith. That Jesus is our temple. Our acceptance of Jesus as a friend and a life partner makes it possible for us to, to worship every day and to include others and to welcome others and to make the case that all are welcome in God's family, in God's house, in our hearts because of Christ. So, the story that I said came from just over the weekend. Some of you know Sarah and T.W. They joined our church just during the past year. Like many people, uh, they tried to figure out how to successfully get married during a pandemic. They started with wanting to be married on April 4th. They realized they needed to move back to March 24th out in our courtyard with just them, their dog, and their parents. And now, last night, at a beautiful outdoor venue, they celebrated their marriage, including now their family, their friends, their colleagues. And, and the image that I will always remember is actually from Friday night. Because Friday night, while a brass group, DFW Brass, was inside the sanctuary recording music for a Christmas uh, piece that will be shared with the congregation. We were out in the courtyard hearing the music in the background and for me watching Sarah and TW lovingly invite people into that space, almost like Jesus saying, you're welcome here. 
you're important here because this is a sacred place for me. I want it to be a sacred place for you. And I think that's the message that Christ shares with us every day. Even when tables are flying, even when all of our emotions are in play, we are blessed to be blessings for others. Thanks be to God for that. Thanks be to God for the ways that uh, Lance has reminded us that during this pandemic time when we haven't celebrated communion uh, in the gathering, that a kind of fasting isn't doing nothing, but a fasting is a, it's a preparation and it's a celebration of community that communion symbolizes. And so I hope that in the time until we begin to do communion again, that you will give thanks to God for the blessings of life, for unconditional love, for forgiveness, and thank God for all the ways that we can help that be the case for others. Let us pray. Oh God, we say thank you for all the ways, all the ways that you enable us to be quick, but not to hurry. May we always be eager and proactive to make a difference for others. And may we always do that in Jesus' name, who teaches us now to pray together as we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now may the love of God be above you to overshadow you, be beneath you to uphold you, go before you to guide you, be behind you to protect you, and be close beside you and within you to make you able for all things. And may it reward your faith and your faithfulness with the peace and the joy which this world cannot give and neither can it take away. Go now in peace.